Hey. to the final session of this course, which will be on double negation. I dedicate this lecture um, to Lauren Cohn and to Ariel Callison, who are doing um, uh, work I really much, uh, very much admire on yeah, this, this topic. But I've learned this topic from somebody else, namely from uh, Thierry Cocon, um, uh, um, who, by the way, is one of the founders of the POC proof assistant. And fun fact, uh, Thierry has a wife, Katharina Cocon, and she is one of the founders of the Yagda proof assistant. I don't know of any other married couple where each component of the couple um, brought forward a proof assistant, which then went on to attract quite a amount of people. Um, double negation. Um, recall the following from lecture two, the central theorem of our course. Um, from any constructive proof, we can extract a program. What do we mean by program? So briefly, we talked about super Turing machines, hypothetical Turing machines, which can run for longer than infinity. But that was not um, meant in the statement. There, I meant ordinary Turing machine. Um, this is here in quotation marks. It's more a motto, but we formalized that. The actual theorem or, uh, theorem was the soundness theorem. If heighting arithmetic proves some formula phi, then that formula phi is realized by an ordinary Turing machine. And by the way, also by a super Turing machine and also by any other kind of machine you might think of as soon as long as uh, it satisfies a certain minimal requirement we ask the, um, um, uh, the pre precise notion to look up in case you're interested in the most general version of machines is partial combinatory algebra. And Larian here from, from before um, uh, is working on extend, among others, other people is working on extending that no, quite general notion to even more general notions. Um, anyway, that was the theory. Um, let's just have a, as a warm up, let's have a look at one case of the proof again. Um, so for proving that, we checked that all the ax axioms of heighting arithmetic are each realizable. And then also that the rules of heighting arithmetic preserve realizability. Um, <clears throat> and just, okay, let's have a look at one of the parts again. Um, for instance, there's the following rule in heighting arithmetic. Um, without any preconditions, um, alpha entails alpha or beta. <clears throat> Given that uh, under the assumption alpha, we are justified in concluding alpha or beta, weakening. We forget a little bit of information. We now just remember that alpha or beta holds, whereas the assumption was that we even knew very specifically that alpha holds. Okay. Important rule in logic, we use it all over the place uh, when, when writing up proofs containing disjunction. Um, and why is it realized? <clears throat> a realizer for alpha implies alpha or beta. Um, what does it do? It looks like this. Um, do you prefer JavaScript or Python? Python? Python, good. Um, so let's use uh, Python code in order to write down this realizer. Um, I will call that realizer E, like often. Yeah. It reads as input x, input, um, a realizer for alpha, yeah. And the output should be a realizer for alpha or beta. That's the task that our realizer needs to satisfy. And if we now um, go back um, to um, the rules of realizability, which are, for instance, displayed here, then we see that a realizer for disjunction um, is a pair. 
where the force component is zero or non-zero, depending on whether we want to uh, realize the first or the second disjunct. And then the second component needs to be a realizer of the respective disjunct. So if we want um, a realizer of the required form, sorry, it's now the chat window went away. If we want a realizer of the required form, then we would uh, do the following. We return the tuple consisting of zero and X. That would be the realizer for this implication. We read a realizer for alpha as input and output a realizer for alpha or beta, namely this pair. If you wanted a realizer for the similar situation that beta implies alpha or beta, then we would return one comma, the given realizer for alpha. So far, so good, you're welcome. Um, and the um, goal of this lecture is to extend this theorem um, to classical proofs and extract programs from classical proofs. Um, do you have any questions, comments, ideas right now about um, yeah, this part of the proof or realizability in general before we continue. Now would be a good time. Later is also a good time, but I thought it wouldn't hurt to ask. Okay. Um, then let's, um, let's check. Why is it that this theorem here is restricted to constructive proofs. Why can we not extract using exactly the same procedure proofs from classical program, uh, proofs, uh, programs from classical proofs? Um, what is the problem with extracting programs from classical proofs? Why don't we have um, the following? If PA proves phi, then phi is realized. Um, PA is the same as Heiting arithmetic, um, but it's called Piano arithmetic. And it has one additional axiom compared to Heiting arithmetic, namely it has the law of student middle built in. Um, so it's a foundational system for classical mathematics. And yeah, how would we try to prove that? Well, in the same spirit, we would check all the axioms um, of PA and check that they are realizable. And we would check for all the rules of PA that these preserve realizability. Okay, and most of the work has already been done in the previous Thomas theorem. We now just need to have a look at the one new axiom of PA com in, comparison, in comparison with HA. Um, um, for this, the law of excluded middle, LEM would need, hello, you're welcome, to have a realizer because that's the only new thing. And now let's check uh, what such a realizer for the law of the middle uh, would need to do. You didn't uh, miss much. Uh, we just had a recap that we have this motto from any constructive proof, we can extract a program. This is formalized by this theorem. Um, here, just again, one of the many cases in the theorem. And now we are concerned with the question, how can we extract programs from classical proofs, from proofs in piano arithmetic? Um, okay, for this, the law of the middle would need to have a realize, realizer. Um, um, how would uh, such a realizer look like? Okay, um, because you preferred Python earlier, now let's also use Python as pseudocode. I will give a name for this hypothetical realizer. I will not call it E, I will call it Oracle. Um, and the input, uh, oh, I'm sorry, and Python comments are not with slash slash, right? Good. 
in a Python, um, the input for this realizer would be um, some proposition A, a proposition A. And the output should be, well, either this output should be 0x, where x s uh, is a realizer for A, or the output should be 1x, 1y, where y is a realizer for not A. Now that is the, the job description. A realizer for the law of student middle would need to do that because the law of student middle states A or not A. More precisely for any A, A or not A. So reader A is input and then somehow magically determine whether um, A holds or whether A does not hold and in both cases uh, supply suitable realizers for the subclaim in question. Okay. Um, how should we implement that? In special cases, for certain special A's, we might be able to determine whether A is true or not. But how should we do that in general? What if A is some statement like um, there are infinitely many uh, print uh, tw twin primes? Currently, no human on this earth, at least not publicly known, um, knows whether this is true or whether this is false. But also much more um, basic thing, things like um, given, given a function from n to n, where we have the conjecture that the minimum value of this function is seven, uh, we might now ask, um, is there a smaller value than seven? Yes or no? How should we determine that? Uh, if we were an omniscient being, then we could just have a look at all the function values and then see whether there's a smaller value than seven. But as an, as an ordinary Turing machine written up in Python pseudocode, I don't see how this would work. And in fact, you have seen um, that certain statements are realized, which contradict the law of excluded middle. So it's just a fact of life that um, the law of excluded middle does not have a real answer. Oh, well, still let's try to build one. Here's my proposal. We return a pair with the first component, component one. So we claim that not A holds. I just claim that. Yeah, you're asking me, Ingo, does A or not A holds? I say, well, not A holds. That is um, that is a better. So I don't know whether this actually, whether this is actually true, but just from concerns of practicality, um, that will be a better answer than saying A holds, because if I'm claiming that A holds, then you will ask next. Okay, well, then can you tell me a realizer for A? And then I noticed that I cannot because I was just guessing. Yeah? But if I say that not A holds, the situation is different. Recall not A is an abbreviation for A implies bottom. So if I claim that not A holds, then I claim that A implies bottom. And what does a realizer for A implies bottom look like? That would be a function which reads as input a realizer for A and then outputs a realizer for bottom. Um, but the important point is it's not like some end result, some final result, it's a function. And so I can procrastinate a little bit. Yeah? So let's return a second component, a function. It will be an, an anonymous function um, here. Yeah? This will be a realizer for A implies bottom. So it will take uh, as an argument um, a lowercase x, which would be a realizer for A. An output should be a realizer for bottom, yeah? That is the job description of this um, anonymous function we are writing down here. Okay, and now you might think that um, uh, we haven't gained much because how should I now turn this realizer for A into a realizer for bottom? This is impossible, especially if you consider that there are no realizers for bottom. How should I write down a realizer for bottom? Okay, 
But now, um, let's assume that we are not using ordinary Python, but a superpowered version of Python, where we not only have the return keyword, but an additional keyword called outer return. The semantics of this outer return keyword is that, um, that uh, we return from that Oracle call again. So like it, it's like we travel back in time to that instant where somebody called this Oracle function and got as a result this pair consisting of the number one and then this anonymous function. We travel back to that instant in time, but now the return value will be the pair consisting of zero and X. I call that outer return because we don't return a value from this lambda, from this anonymous function. Instead, we return a value um, from, from this call of the outer function. And well, that's a realizer for the law of excluded middle. In this improved version of Python, where we have this outer return statement available. available. In this version, um, in, in, uh, that works for any language which has support for backtracking, yeah? where we can later on change our mind about what the result of what the return value of our function call should have been. We can later on jump back in time to that instant where that a function was called and now supply a different return value to the caller. And Python is not one of those languages. However, Scheme is and many, uh, many, many flavors of Lisp are. And um, uh, you could uh, try to implement that um, um, if, for instance, you do a full computer emulation, because then just before returning, you take a snapshot. Um, also, like when you, when you do like speed runs of games, yeah, you do a quick sn snapshot of the current state yeah, for later safekeeping. Then you, then you return whatever you wanted to return. But in case you later need to change your mind, you just restore the earlier snapshot and load that again, and then continue from there, this time returning something different. Okay. The upshot is, um, there is no realizer for LEM in ordinary programming languages, like, like Turing machines. But there is a realizer Lem in languages with support for backtracking. Backtracking is the general computer science term for when you uh, later need to correct an earlier decision. Um, a standard example of backtracking is when you fill out a Sudoku and you kind of believe that in that cell, uh, like a seven needs to go, and then you continue and it looks good for a while, but then later on you notice you are getting stuck um, and then you need to backtrack and think, ah, oh, well, that seven was not the only possibility. It could have also been another. Let's try this another, this other possibility. So in languages with support for backtracking, we, um, we do have the theorem. Theorem. If PA proves phi, so if there is a classical proof of phi, then phi is realized, well, not realized in the traditional sense, but in this improved sense, or let's, let's not uh, put this value judgment into that, in this different sense, um, this is saying that there is a realizer for phi, but a realizer which might backtrack. In this sense, from every classical proof, we can extract a program, which might backtrack. Okay, that is already um, an important um, uh, thing to, to take home. Yeah? So from constructive proofs, we can extract proper programs and from classical proofs, we can also extract programs. However, there will be programs which might need to backtrack. Yeah. 
Uh -huh. yeah. Great, great question. So um, there's a reason why there are not that many program languages which, with native support for backtracking, namely because backtracking for all its uses is also a dangerous feature. Because um, if you're not being careful, then using backtracking, you can easily implement a program which, even though you did not intend that, uh, is stuck in an infinite loop by just backtracking again and again and again, but never making progress. It's like this Sudoku example. Yeah, you, 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 you tried to fill in a seven. Then later on, with, after filling in more stuff, you noticed that the seven did not work. So you backtrack. And then you decide to try a seven again, the same seven again. Of course, you will get stuck again. Then you backtrack again. Then you try the same seven again. You get stuck again and so on. Yeah. So that's a, a danger when working with program languages which, which support backtracking. However, um, this, um, uh, this danger is made safe um, by this theorem, because this theorem tells us that, um, um, that from any PA proof of some, some statement phi, we can extract a program making use of backtracking. And this program will actually be correct in the sense of realizability because I'm not stating here then there is some random program. That is not what the theorem is saying. I'm saying then there's a program in the generalized sense using backtracking, which realizes phi. Yeah? So if you don't uh, write up your programs manually, just typing in the keyboard, but instead if you um, use this theorem in order to build your programs by extracting programs from classical proofs, you can be sure that the resulting programs will be correct. They might require backtracking, even lots of backtracking, but not the kind of erroneous backtracking where we are uh, stuck in an infinite loop. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, because uh, we can, uh, the first one, because we will be able to try something different, yeah. as we did here. So first we return this pair to the caller, which indicates to the caller that option number one holds, so that not A holds. And also we give to the caller a realizer for the claim that not A holds, which is a function from, uh, uh, which is a function which inputs a realizer for A and outputs a realizer for bottom. But as soon as this function is called by the caller, we steal their witness of A and then decide, change our mind. And instead in that Oracle call return zero comma X. So indicate to the caller that the uh, zero alternative holds, that A holds and we supply uh, Realizer for it. Um, you can um, translate this Python code into a fairy tale. Uh, let me quickly relate it. Um, um, there's like the queen, and the queen asks her philosopher, philosopher to either bring her the uh, sorcerer's stone or to devise a procedure for using the sorcerer's stone to create infinite amounts of gold. So the philosopher doesn't have any clue where to find the sorcerer's stone. Hence, um, he chooses the second alternative. He says to the, uh, to the queen, well, dear queen, I will try to devise a method for turning uh, for using uh, uh, the saucer stone to produce infinite amounts of gold. Okay, and then like two days later, uh, he turns and says, well, I, I found it. And then the queen perhaps says, okay, demonstrate it. And then the philosopher, philosopher, the philosopher will say, well, well, I will gladly demonstrate that. If you could please supply me uh, the saucer stone, then I will create infinite amounts of gold with that. And as long as the queen herself has not obtained the saucer stone, he is safe. 
right? Because his bluff um, cannot be called by the queen. So he feels, he feels safe. Until 20, day, 20 years later, the queen, using other means, has acquired the source of stone. Now she's calling for the philosopher again and now presents him the stone and asks him to use that stone to create infinite amounts of gold, which he promised that he would be able to do 20 years ago. And what he does is the following. He takes the stone and then tells the queen, well, recall you asked me to either acquire the stone or explain how to create infinite amounts of gold with it. Here you have the stone. In real life, that wouldn't work. Um, yeah, the, the queen would just be mad. But with backtracking, it would work. Yeah, if like the philosopher would actually jump back in time to that fateful day where he got that uh, job from the queen, um, then he will just like um, appear in uh, out of thin air with the stone in hand and hand it to the queen. And that's exactly what's happening. Here. Let's have a look at our next uh, at one more example. Um, let's consider the following statement. For every function from n to n, there is a number um, a such that for all numbers b, f of a is less than or equal to f of b. What does this statement tell us? in plain English. For every function f, there is a number a such that for every number b, f of a is less than or equal to f of b. Any function a Indeed. Every function attains a minimum, namely f of a, yeah? using the language from, uh, using the formal language, it would be f of a. Yeah? Because for any other function value, f of b, f of a will be uh, strictly smaller or at most the same. Does this statement have a constructive proof? If you are unsure, then just check whether there's a realizer for that. Because if there was a constructive proof of this statement, then there would also be a realizer. So can you write down a Python function which reads as input um, uh, it would be called minimum. The input would be a function f from n to n and the output would be um, a pair consisting um, of two things a and p where a is a natural number and where p is itself a function, is a function which uh, inputs a number b. Um, and which outputs a realizer for, for f of a being less than or equal to f of b. Actual Python um, does not contain realizers for um, uh, this, um, or like proofs, actual proofs for uh, these kind of atomic statements. Um, uh, if that was an actual Python program, then I would just use some placeholder value for that. But I would, um, I would still want my function p to satisfy this contract. So the function p should input a number b, and then output something, but it should be the case that f of a is actually less than or equal to f of b. Okay, that would be the, uh, that is uh, what a realizer for this statement would need to do. And now observe that this uh, programming exercise is not solvable by a standard dimension. Now we can start inspecting the values of f and thereby obtain some conjecture about the value of the minimum, but we will never be sure that we have actually obtained the minimum. 
can we implement that using backtracking? Right? Yeah, provable, yeah. So we can indeed, brilliant answer. Uh, can you now give a constructive um, uh, proof of your claim? So can you actually tell me uh, a, a Python program uh, which using backtracking determines the minimum? Or just describe it in English first. Yeah, right. And then uh, for the rest is the function that describes the both numbers. Yeah. And uh, when you find uh, one that is more than equal of zero, backtracks. Exactly. And instead of using zero, yeah. you choose one. Yeah. And you go on. Yeah. Uh, on, uh, or doesn't choose one, but the uh, but, but exactly that counter example provided by the caller. Yes, exactly. So if uh, if uh, if somebody gives me a random function f from n to n and asks me what the minimum value is, then I just say, well, the minimum value is f of zero, the very first value of the function. Might be true, right? Okay. Um, might also be false, but at least I supplied some answer. And if they later noticed that I lied, if they later noticed that f of zero is 10, but f of five is two, so that 10 can surely not be that minimum value, then I just backtrack and say, recall the time where I said that the minimum value would be f of zero, that was an error, I meant f of that, that other uh, position. And then we can continue again for a bit. And perhaps, um, perhaps the person I'm interacting with, the caller, doesn't actually need a true minimum value. Perhaps they just need a value which is minimal among all those values of the function which are actually inspected. And then um, after perhaps backtracking a couple more times, I might still not have arrived at the true value for the absolute minimal value. However, it will be good enough for the purposes of the caller. If they don't challenge my claim, then, uh, then that's not my business. We can implement that in Python as follows. Uh, we first try zero, and here is uh, the go function. Um, we say, well, a, f of a is the absolute minimum value. And now we need to uh, supply a lambda exp uh, expression, an anomalous function, which reads an arbitrary number b as input, and now tries to obtain a realizer for this. And uh, we do that as follows. We check whether f of a happens to be um, smaller than or equal to f of b. Then we return a, a witness of that. Um, and else, um, we um, outer return with go of uh, b. The outer return refers to the go function, not to the minimum function, else it would be outer outer return. OK, so we try 0 first. And if um, that might work, and in case some, uh, our, somebody calls, calls us with a b such that f of a is larger than f of b, so that f of a cannot be the minimum value, then we just try again with f of b as our new claim for the absolute minimum value. Yeah, so back in, that, back in that instant where we returned this pair, we now return the pair consisting of b, comma, and then the lambda expression. A realizer using backtracking for this statement. Yeah. A realizer without backtracking is not possible. To, um, uh, yeah, as discussed. Um, okay. Uh, 
Ja. Aha. Ja. Indeed. Yeah, uh, awesome that you already know about continuations. That is exactly what we will use now. Um, uh, because you're raising in, uh, uh, an important point. Uh, what if our favorite programming language doesn't support backtracking? Um, or let me also state it in a different manner. Um, this theorem here is nice and well. From any classical proof, we can construct, uh, we can extract a program which might backtrack. Okay, cool. Um, but even better would be to extract a program which does not backtrack, but which is just an honest program. Can we also do that? Um, and the answer is yes. Uh, let me explain. Um, and that is, um, that brings us to the double negation translation. Observe the following. Uh, while A or not A is not constructively provable, its close cousin not not A or not A is constructively provable. A or not A might fail in constructive mathematics, but its double negation works. Let's check that. Here's a constructive proof. So claim it's not not the case that A or not A holds. And just so you can prepare yourself, the proof will be quite short, three or four lines. It will not use prime numbers or advanced tools from partial differential equations, but still it will be a little bit of brain teaser. Okay, how to prove that? Um, well, recall, negation is defined as implication to bottom, yeah? Um, so we need to actually verify this and, and recall the same fact again. So that is what we actually need. Oops, uh, that is what we actually need uh, to prove. So now observe uh, in, after this uh, tiny tidy formatting, uh, we need to verify an implication. So um, assume the thing in the beginning, we need to verify bottom. It feels different, uh, it feels difficult to verify bottom, but let's just see uh, where the proof will carry us. Um, I'm now doing a subclaim. Um, subclaim, I'm claiming that not A holds. Okay. Uh, here's the uh, proof of that subclaim. Assume A. Then in particular, A or not A. That's just weakening. And now notice we have assumed that if A or not A holds, then bottom. By assumption, bottom. So this subproof verifies that not A holds because not A is an abbreviation for A implies bottom. Okay. So from, from almost nothing, we now managed to prove something of value, namely we proved that not A holds. Um, now, let me, let me verify bottom. Um, as not A, that is something which we have established, um, as this holds, um, in particular, we have A or not A. We use weakening again just the other weakening to the, uh, to the right now. If not A holds, then in particular A or not A. Now we use the assumption again, which states that if A or not A holds, then bottom. Hence, bottom. We are done, that's the proof. We can also prove that in ACTA, um, let's quickly do it. Um, um, let's me, let me call that Oracle again. Um, even though it's not the true Oracle from before, 
um, A to bottom to bottom uh, A. Um, or not A implies um, bottom implies um, bottom. That was the claim. Yeah. Uh, let's implement that. I just need to define um, bottom first, and I need to define negation. Not uh, A is A to bottom. And I need to define or. Um, like um, this. Good. Now I have everything compiled. And now let's use the automatic mode. There's the proof. Um, yeah, so um, that works. Um, if you're interested in that, then I invite you to later spend time um, uh, with that expression and try to understand it. Um, that sometimes happens this control C, control A, either doesn't work at all or produces in an instant a proof which you then need to decipher as a human in case you, you want to, to, to decipher it. Okay, so um, A or not A is not constructively provable, but its doubly negated version is. And um, this uh, brings, this uh, gives the following idea. Idea define um, a classical version of or, like, um, yeah, define a classical version, CL classical of or, and define a classical version of the exist existence quanti um, um, existential quantifier. And we will also need a classical version of equality, the follows. We say alpha classical or beta, is by definition um, not, not alpha or beta. And we say uh, is uh, like this is not not an usual. Good, and also here. One minute, please. I should automate that. Good, that works. And now just Zoom needs to connect again. Awesome, uh, share the screen again. Good. Okay, classical versions, classical uh, like this, and then also the classical equals x equals classical equals y, uh, we define it like this. Okay, I'm still working in the context of constructive mathematics, um, but I'm introducing three new logical symbols, namely the classical or, I, but just, that's the name, yeah? The classical exists and the classical equality. And then I observe the following, all the rules from classical logic, which I would expect um, la, like all the De Morgan rules here, yeah? Even those which don't hold constructively, they do hold if we use this new or CL. Um, and we don't need to define a classical version of and or of implies because um, there's no difference between the constructive and classical meaning 
uh, for those other logical connectors. Yeah? Just these are like the, the problematic ones. Um, okay, uh, using that we do the, uh, yeah, um, observe. We have, for any A, we have A classical or not A. In this sense, constructive mathematics is an expansion of classical mathematics. Because we have the, um, like the classical or and the classical exists available in constructive mathematics in case we need it. It's just that uh, we need to put this double negation in front of it. Yeah. So if a classical mathematician states alpha or beta, then perhaps we cannot justify their claim in constructive mathematics. But don't worry, just reinterpret what they were saying to mean not not alpha or beta. And then we will be able to to constructively justify that. Huh? Um, in the other direction, it doesn't work. Um, in, in classical mathematics, we cannot do a similar trick, translation trick like here. Um, well, because double negation is trivial in classical mathematics. Classical mathematics is, is insensitive, is blind to this difference. Constructed different, uh, constructive mathematics is not. By default, our logical connectives carry a stronger, more informative meaning. But in case we want the old classical meaning, just slap a double negation in front of it. And this brings us the double negation translation. Um, for a formula phi, um, it's double negation translation phi star is obtained by replacing any or by the classical or any exists by the classical exists and any equals by the classical exists. That is the double negation translation of a formula. For instance, um, recall um, here we have this statement uh, that every function f obtains a minimum and we can now compute its double negation translation. Yeah? And this will be the following. It will start out exactly the same for all functions f from n to n. Now here we are encountering an existential quantifier. We need to put a double negation in here before continuing. Like this. Now there is um, uh, quant uh, universal quantification again, that's fine. Okay, now we have this. Um, so in order to do that, I should first spell out what it means for a number to be less than or equal to, that has a certain definition, and then apply the translation to that. Let me shortcut that a little bit. The end result will be that we have this, just yet another um, double negation. Okay, and this statement now does have a constructive proof. And that constructive proof will make use of the, this constructed version of the law of excluded middle. Um, the intuitive idea why this works is because um, that we can reason under double negation by which I mean the following. It is a constructive tautology, so a constructive theorem that we have the following. So assuming that we have not not A and assuming that A would imply B. You would think that um, knowing that A implies B is not of much use if we are only given not not A because we don't actually have A. Huh? If you know that A implies B, then fair enough. A, if A would be true, then also B would be true. But A isn't true. We just know that uh, we just know uh, no, not not A. However, it turns out that this is actually uh, more useful than it first appears. We do have the following. We can constructively prove that. That is what I mean by we can reason under double negation. Um, we will not be able to escape from the double negation. Um, but still, we can 
do something under the double negation. If we know that A implies B, then uh, we can, uh, and if we also know that not not A, then we uh, can, can carry our argument forward to obtain not not B. And if we would then know that B implies C, then we would could use that again and obtain not not C and so on and so forth. Um, more precisely, we have the following meta theorem. And of course, that meta theorem, which I will write down, has a constructive proof, yeah? else I would like put warning signs on it. Um, this consists of four subparts. Firstly, classically, um, phi star is equivalent to phi, right? Inserting all those double negations doesn't do anything from the point of view of classical logic. Secondly, constructively in intuitionistic logic, we do have, we have the following, not not phi star implies phi star. We don't generally have that in constructive mathematics, that the claim that we would have that generally would be the um, law of double negation elimination. But we do have that for formulas of the form phi star. That is because exactly at those points uh, where we would get stuck, otherwise we have a double negation to rescue us. Um, um, in the following sense, we do have this in constructive mathematics. Not, 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 not alpha implies not, not alpha. I think that was an exercise on the first sheet. Yeah? So um, most statements are not, um, don't have this property, but doubly negated statements do have it. And those five stars also have it. You prove that by considering all the possible cases for phi, by doing induction proof on phi. Um, now let me write down uh, uh, number three, which is um, useful and also a warning. Um, constructively, we have the following. Um, phi star is equivalent to not not phi. What's the difference between those two sides? Here with the phi star, we um, inserted lots of double negations in front of that and in front of that, in, in front of any or, in, in front of any existential and in front of any atomic statement. Here on the right-hand side, we just inserted a single not double negation at the very beginning. And indeed, we don't have this equivalence in general. Yeah? Uh, we only have that if phi is of a certain form, if phi is a coherent formula. What's a current formula? That's a formula um, in which only the following things occur and not the other things. Um, equal may occur, top, bottom, and, or exists, um, uh, but not um, implies and not for all occur. Okay. That's a so-called coherent formula. For instance, this piece here is not a Korean formula because universals appear in it. Okay. But for Korean formulas, it is the case that phi to the star can be simplified to just putting a single double negation at the very front. Again, you could check that by induction proof on phi. In fact, I put that as an exercise if you want that. And now the Important thing is number four. These were all just warm ups. Now we have number four. Number four states um, classical logic proves um, alpha entails beta from some set gamma of axioms, might be the axioms of piano arithmetic or whatever. Classic logic proves this entailment if and only if constructive logic 
more precisely intuitionistic logic, proves um, alpha star entails beta star from um, the set gamma star, where what is gamma star? Where gamma star uh, contains the following axioms. Um, I take all the axioms, uh, lowercase gamma, uh, contained in capital gamma, and apply the double negation constellation to each of them in turn. This theorem here, number four, um, is the second most important theorem of this mini course. It states that we can turn classical proofs into constructive proofs. There is a price to pay for it. it. Namely, we need to slightly change the claim of the proof. Whereas before it proved that alpha entails beta, now the transform proof verifies that alpha star entails beta star. And it also doesn't make use of the same axioms, but of the doubly negated, uh, of the translated axioms. But still, it's a very powerful meta theorem. It turns classical proofs into constructive proofs of related statements. And notice that in general, we cannot do any better. We cannot magically turn classical proofs of any statement into a constructive proof of the same statement, because it's just a fact of life that not all uh, provable things in classical mathematics are also provable in constructive mathematics. For instance, the law of the middle is not provable in constructive mathematics. So, so something does need to change uh, and what's changes, what changes here is the statement of the, um, the statement, namely instead of having a proof that alpha entails better, we have a proof that alpha star entails better star. Next, I would like to do an example illustrating that. Um, and then we are almost done. Then I just want to present um, um, a surprise. And then we just talk about these results. Do you have any questions, comments, suggestions? Go ahead. Excellent question. The answer is we don't need to um, if we are just concerned with Heighting and piano arithmetic. The reason why we don't need that there is because um, 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 because heighting arithmetic already proves that any two numbers are equal or not equal. That is this exercise here. Yeah. Um, and hence, so, so like this is already an instance of the law of student middle, a provable, a constructively provable instance. And hence, we don't need the double negation in order to cheat. Yeah? However, the double negation translation is more general. It works also in uh, cases where our base theory is not heighting arithmetic or piano arithmetic, uh, but where it's a more general uh, the base system, including those base systems where we don't, where we cannot prove that for any x and y, x equals y, or x is not equal y. And hence, for like general sake of generality, I, to be sure, I included this case. Strictly speaking, I would have to, if all we care about is hiding and piano. Excellent, excellent observation. And you had a question. Yes, if you have comments, uh, sorry for the long answer, but yeah. um, when, I, um, when I graduated, I skipped my um, mm -hmm. and there were, there were both a commission, yeah. and, uh, analysis professor, yeah. Yeah. And they they said uh, about my thesis that was about uh, using my theory for the foundation of uh -huh. Yeah, but we like to use uh, some lemma or yeah. stories. Yeah. So correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. This means that we could uh, prove their theorems yeah. in, inside the constructive mathematics. Yeah. And they he get along with us because uh, for them it's the same. Exactly. And uh, for us, 
is to me a different thing. But yeah. some you are exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. Um, any piece of classical mathematics can be translated using this technique to a new piece of constructive mathematics, which to our eyes is a different, uh, proves different statements, but to classical eyes, it's exactly the same. Notice a classical mathematician doesn't see any difference between those two statements. They would just say, well, why did you uh, waste chalk writing those double negations? It, you can just cancel them. But they, they would still agree that even if that is like a, a waste of chalk, but there's no difference between these two. Yeah, exactly. There's one catch. Um, uh, this translation uh, uh, only manages to get rid of the double negations, not of the axiom of choice. Um, if you want to also constructivize uses of the axiom of choice, uh, you need more advanced techniques. Let me just tell you the words for that, the keywords, so that you have something for looking up, but not to spend time right now. Uh, the keywords are the following. Um, either you use Gödel Sandbox L, the universe of constructible sets, because it, uh, it is a theorem of Zermelo Frankel without choice, that internally to his Gödel Sandbox L choice holds. Yeah? Um, and uh, then you are just left with double uh, with, with the love stood middle, and that can be dealt with using this approach. Uh, so to interpret the axiom of choice in constructive mathematics, first apply the L translation, and then apply the double negation translation. That's one approach. Another is to employ methods of point-free topology. Okay. So these are the keywords, and then later on we can connect it. Any more questions, comments at this point? Yes. Yeah. 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 Indeed. Indeed. And we can do that. Yeah. There's just one disadvantage, namely, uh, without postulating arbitrary stuff, you can run any actor code. Because the actor proving programming is the same, and um, uh, and you can try to do the same if you have postulates. But as soon as your code actually uses as postulate, the uh, the execution will will get to a halt. But that's the only press. And there's one more question in the in the chat. Um, does um, negative uh, translation exhibit any kind of monadic behavior? Um, yes, indeed. So uh, this person knows about Haskell. Um, we have this, yeah. We have even more. Um, even more, we have the following. Okay. Um, and uh, now let me write, uh, use different notation for that. Uh, let's use NAB line instead of double negation. Yeah. Um, then we have like this. Um, now let's um, format that like um, this. Still the same. Um, and now perhaps formulated using single arrows like uh, this. And I'll get rid of um, these additional parentheses. And now notice um, if we perhaps write it like this. But this has a well-known name in Haskell. That's the uh, join uh, the, the bind operation. Haskell. Um, Haskell bind operation. Have a look. It has, um, let's see, it has exactly the same type here. MA, A to MB, MB. MA, A to MB, MB. It's exactly what's written here. So indeed, double negation is a monad. And that, for those of you who know what a monad is, 
And this is the bind operation of the monad. And then there's also a return operation. Uh, uh, name, that is the operation which gives, uh, brings us from A to not not A. Um, I suggest the following. I suggest we do like a five minute break and then I show you an example for that. And um, then at the end, I will show you this surprise. Um, namely, sometimes uh, we can do better than that. Sometimes we can turn a con classical proof of alpha entails better into a constructive proof of the same statement, not of the translated statements. Okay. Good. Couple minutes break. Let's put this online. Uh, the question is why I'm, am I using ACTA instead of another proof assistant? Um, the honest quest answer is the following um, uh, because by chance I learned ACTA first. That's the honest answer. Uh, so I was interested in proof assistance for a long time, but didn't really like get around to learning them. I, I started a couple of times, but it was very frustrating and I just had other things to do and I stopped. And then I intended a beautiful um, lecture series by Martin Escardo. Welcome. Um, this person here um, who happened to give a course on ACTA and then I was sold. That's the honest answer, but I will construct a different answer soon. Um, let me just make uh, perhaps a uh, um, uh, short commercial break. Um, there is a, a school called Proof and Computation um, that have, has been going on now for several years. And um, next time it will happen uh, here in September this year um, in Frischbach Au. This is, which is a very small town in, um, in Germany. Yeah. Eight, now, eight, hour, well, eight hours from here by train. Um, and uh, I really, really like this series of autumn schools. I learned a lot from these autumn school, um, uh, schools. One of the main organizers is Peter Schuster, uh, who also organized this course here. Um, he's really a very prolific um, mathematician and uh, especially a prolific organizer. And yeah, the topics are like the usual topics. Yeah, constructive mathematics, type theory, extraction of programs from proofs. And it's quite an impressive lineup. Uh, for instance, you have here Monica, who will talk about program extraction and verification, um, where she will go um, into much more details than what was possible here. That was just the first glimpse. For instance, she will also be concerned with the efficiency of the extracted programs or something which we didn't care about. Um, and then Thierry Cocor, one of the founders of COC, yeah, about topography and constructive mathematics, and then also lots of other interesting causes. Uh, so I very much uh, invite you to check this out. Um, in case you are interested in attending, but don't have like the funding resource to go there, we will find a solution uh, using funds from Verona or them or whatever, there will be some solution. Um, and you need to apply, uh, and I think you need to apply soon because the deadline has passed. Okay, so quickly, you know, in academic circles, deadlines are never meant seriously. Yeah, when they say deadline is 7th June, they don't mean deadline is 7th June. Um, uh, but that means that every day now they might come around to like checking the applications, and that will be the actual deadline. So I encourage you to write an email to them. You need a, ref a reference letter. Um, I'm sure one of your professors uh, will be happy to supply a reference letter, but you can also ask me to supply a reference letter. Uh, so that shouldn't be an issue. Uh, the important thing is to get the application out quickly and then later on um, uh, follow with a reference letter. I really, really like this uh, auto school. Um, another answer to the question why I'm using ACTA and not uh, some other proof assistant is the following. Um, for instance, I'm not using Lean because the Lean community is focused on classical mathematics. The Lean proof system itself um, works for both, but the community is centered on classical mathematics. Um, I'm not using COC because just, it's just a matter of personal preference. I more enjoy the style of writing in ACTA where we write proof terms and not proof scripts. And the many advantages COC has over ACTA are not important to my personal research. For instance, COC has um, great support for um, 
or has much better support for, for tactics, for automated reasoning. Uh, but I don't need that because I like to prove the things on my own. Uh, I don't want to get the job done as quickly as possible, for instance, because I'm tasked with verifying the correctness of some program. Um, I'm interested in the proofs because I want to understand things. And they're having a, an automatic mode. Um, it's not that useful to me. Of course, I, everyone would like a better automatic mode in ACTA, or me as well, but uh, I, it's not a big thing that it isn't available for the specific purposes I'm using it. And everyone has their own purposes. And perhaps um, COC, which by the way, has been renamed to ROCK, ROCQ is a better choice. Just, just try it. In any sense, uh, in any case, it's good to know several proof systems you know, to, to, to broaden your horizon and to be prepared to the day when a good proof system finally arrives. All the currently existing proof systems are not good. In if you, um, including ACTA, if you um, have the strong expectation that a proof system should be able to undergraduate homework for you, none of those can. You know? Also, right now, I still need to like write code in that editor. What I would actually like to have is like have magical paper where I just using my handwriting write down, but it's like magical. And as soon as I make an error, it gets flagged. And as soon as I um, stop writing for a couple of seconds, uh, it tries to automate auto complete what I was writing. Uh, if I write theorem colon and then write that about a theorem, it will in the background, the paper will start in the background to search for a counterexample or for a proof, whatever finishes first will get displayed and so on. That is my dream and we don't have that, okay? Uh, but in order to get to that dream, we need to master the proof assistance which currently exists. Any other uh, questions, comments, thoughts? Let's have a quick example, and then this surprise. Quick example first. Um, some of you have seen that already in, in Padova. Uh, and don't worry, uh, other new material will, will appear, so uh, you won't be bored. Um, recall Dixon's lemma from the first lecture. Um, this states in its most simple version, for any infinite sequence of natural numbers like this one, um, somewhere we ha have that a term is less than uh, or less than or equal to the next term. In this case, alpha of three, this is alpha of one, uh, alpha of zero, alpha of one, alpha of two, alpha of three is smaller than or equal to alpha of four. Dixon's lemma states that this happens with any infinite sequence of natural numbers whatsoever. Okay. Um, here is the statement of Dixon's lemma formulated in ACTA. Um, for any alpha, there is some number i such that alpha of i is less than or equal to alpha of sac i. Sac i, the success of i. Okay, that is the statement. That, that is not yet the proof, but just the statement of Dixon's lemma. Okay, and now uh, uh, here I, I write down a classical proof yeah, uh, using a postulate. I just postulate the law of excluded middle. I call the resulting function, which is just postulated oracle um, for any proposition whatsoever, X or not X, okay? Um, and then um, here um, I have a function minimum, which given an alpha, which is like put in, put in the scope there, it's fixed for the rest of this block. Um, given an alpha, computes a number i such that for every number j, alpha of i is smaller than or equal to alpha of j. That's exactly the minimum condition from before. And how does this um, um, function, I am saying it in, like in, in scare quotes because we cannot actually run this function because it makes use of that oracle, which I just postulated. Yeah. Uh, how does it work? Well, we try zero first yeah, with this go function. And now we ask the oracle, um, is there not some j such that alpha of j is smaller than alpha of zero in the first case? That might be true or it might be false. In case it's true, in case there is some j such that alpha of j is smaller than alpha of i, then alpha of i was not a good guess for the absolute minimum value. Then we try again with alpha of j. But if no, if there's no j such that alpha of j is smaller than alpha of i, then well, then alpha of i is the minimum value 
And here we supply a witness for that. For any j, indeed, alpha of i is smaller than alpha of j. OK. That is here a classical proof that um, functions from n to n always have a minimum. And now I'm using this minimum in order to verify Dixon's lemma. Recall, we want to prove that alpha of some i is smaller than or equal to alpha of i plus 1. And we do it as follows. We compute the minimum. The minimum will be some i, alpha of i. Well, and then uh, it will be true that alpha of i is less than or equal to alpha of i plus 1, because alpha of i is the absolute minimum value. In particular, it will be smaller than alpha of i plus 1. And if we, uh, uh, in, uh, if we apply, uh, if we use suck i as input into the witness p, then that p function will get us exactly what's needed, namely a witness that alpha of i is smaller than alpha of i plus 1. So far, so good. That was um, a formalization of a classical proof in ACTA. Now, let's uh, formalize uh, the same proof um, without using postulates. So we need to apply the double negation translation. And that's something which I, I did here. Um, here, notice, um, notice um, now I'm not claiming that alpha attains a minimum. I'm just saying that it's not not the case that there's a number i such that for every j, it's not not the case that alpha of i is smaller than alpha of j. That was exactly the double negation translation uh, from uh, of the statement that every function has a minimum from before. And uh, I, how did I prove that here? Again, you see a couple of double negations popping up also in auxiliary statements. It's not important to like have a close look at the code here. Um, how did I obtain this code? Well, I copy pasted the old code old code, inserted a couple of double negations, um, and then fixed all, just fixed all the errors which actor kind of flagged for me. Yeah? It was mostly on autopilot. I just inserted the double negations manually in front of existential quantifiers, which are written like this in actor, and in front of this atomic formula. And then I, uh, there were like a couple errors, like five errors, I, check, I, I fixed all of them. Um, uh, because now we had this additional double negation to take care of, and then I was done. And as, and, and as our end result, we can show not Dixon's lemma, but we can show not not Dixon's lemma for alpha. Okay. Good. Even better would be to actually prove Dixon's lemma and not this statement, which to a classical mathematician looks the same, but uh, which actually contains much less information. This here just states that somewhere in the platonic heaven, there's a position i such that alpha of i is smaller than alpha of i plus one. But it, um, this theorem doesn't, um, if we run that, this doesn't give us any clue as to where that i should be found. Recall, realizers for negated statements are never informative. We, we discussed that yesterday. Um, that is just the mere promise that Dixon's lemma holds, but it doesn't give us the actual location um, on the natural numbers line where this holds. Hold the thought. We will return to that um, uh, using a trick. As the su as a surprise I already alluded to a couple of times. We will be able to, um, to give an actual constructive proof of Dixon's lemma. Any questions, comments right now regarding this ACTA code? Okay, then, um, then I have the following objective, namely. So here we have this double negation translation. However, I think you agree, um, it's a little bit mysterious. The, the proof of that theorem is not actually difficult. It's just an induction proof uh, considering all the cases. In case you want to do it, I am sure that you will be able to do it. Um, so proving that meta theorem is not the, the most important uh, or the most difficult thing. Interpreting it rather is the, 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 the hard thing uh, because this double negation just feels mysterious. And one way to, um, to, uh, um, to evaporate the mystery is by turning to realizability. 
because realizability extracts pro programs from our proofs and those programs might be easier to understand. Um, let me do an example. Um, how does a realizer, uh, what does a realizer for a statement of a form for all x in n p of x look like? An ordinary realizer. Well, it would be a function e, which reads as input. Uh, sorry, it's, now it's JavaScript. Let's, let's use JavaScript for, for a change. Yeah, because we've been using Python all the time before. Um, uh, input is a number x, and the output should be a realizer for p of x. Uh, that's a job description for a realizer of the statement. And how will it roughly work? Uh, well, it depends on the specifics, of course, but um, in somehow we need to compute a realizer for pi of, uh, p of x and then return x. That is how a realizer for the statement roughly needs to look like. And the details here depend on this uh, specific situation. Fair enough. Now let's check what a realizer for this statement looks like. In order to understand what this double negation is doing to our programs, we understand how uh, we want to understand what double negation is doing to our, the, our proofs by looking at what it does to our programs. Okay. So it will still input a number, uh, a realizer will still input a number x, but it will now output a realizer for um, the double negation um, of x, yeah? um, which if you recall, that's just an abbreviation for for this, okay? Um, um, okay, now there, um, we need, there's at least one change, namely it's now no longer allowed uh, oh, sorry, not return x, but if the realizer is called r, return that, return that realizer r, okay? We should not return the number back to the uh, user, but uh, the computed realizer. Okay, here it's the same. Okay, but we need to do one, different, uh, one change. Now it's no longer allowed to directly return the realizer um, for p of x. Instead, we need to return a realizer for this not not p of x. Okay, so we need to return a function. Um, a function which takes some argument. Oh, no, I'm using Python again. Um, return function f. Um, and this function input for that function is a realizer for p of x to bottom, and the output should be a realizer for bottom. Okay. And well, one way, uh, one thing we could do is um, do that. So we feed, sorry, r again, we feed that realizer r into the function f, the function f will be a function which reads realizers of p of x input and returns a realizer for bottom. And well, we are tasked with returning a realizer for bottom. Hence, that makes sense. Okay, so far. Uh, instead of computing a realizer for r up there, we could also procrastinate a little bit and only compute it down below will only be required then. And now notice um, the following. Firstly, instead of F, I could call that callback. It's like in uh, web programming, some functions don't immediately give you a result, 
uh, like the fetch function in JavaScript for fetching some, some web page. Instead, they expect you to supply a function which will later then be called back by the fetch procedure. So we don't have something like let um, uh, contents equals fetch and then uh, wikipedia.org slash blah, blah, blah. We don't have that. Yeah. That would be nice, but we don't have that. Instead, the syntax is uh, more the following. Um, fetch wikipedia.org, blah, blah, blah. And then we need to um, supply a callback. And here now we work with the, uh, with the contents. The idea is that fetching this resource from the internet might take some time. And uh, if the API would be like this, then uh, the execution of the program would be stopped until the data from the internet arrived. Whereas here, um, this callback can be called at some later point in time, as soon as the data has arrived. And meanwhile, the program could continue here. Yeah. That is the reason why in web programming, programming, we use this calling convention with the callback. This function here is called callback because it will later be called back from the fetch procedure. Um, uh, perhaps we would like to apply some function um, um, bar to, the, uh, to, the, um, to those contents. Um, um, and perhaps that, uh, that bar function again needs to do some uh, long running task. Then in this, that other style of programming in that callback oriented style, we would write something like this. Now we call the bar function with the contents and um, the result is not returned to us. Instead, we supply a callback, which can then later on make use of the resulting value, uh, value foo. Let's put one more letter, just uh, a layer, just so that uh, it's clear. Uh, it might also be that it's that it will stay ex at the exact uh, same amount of unclearness. But um, let's let's see. Um, perhaps uh, I'm using and applying some further function bus to the result foo, and I could do that in that style by um, doing it like. That. Okay, that here is the direct style of programming. And that is a callback oriented style of programming. You already see that the direct style is uh, it's nicer, it's simpler. But sometimes we are forced to use the callback oriented style of programming. Okay, uh, why this interlude? Well, because here um, this also deserves the uh, the name callback. Yeah? Um, so the idea is a realizer for such a statement is not simply a function which inputs a number x and then outputs a realizer for p of x. Instead, oh, I'm sorry. Did anything break or is it just no problem? No problem. Okay, awesome. Okay. Um, instead, um, a realizer for this kind of statement reads the number x as input and returns a function which is waiting, for, which is awaiting a callback. And then it might compute that realizer. And when it's done, it will call that callback. The crucial thing now is that um, this star layout here is not the only possible layout for a function e, which verifies, which solves that task. Because this computation of a realizer is allowed to use the callback itself. Note, this computation, this computation there, yeah, is allowed to make use of the callback. Um, and that is in contrast with here. 
Here, the task, we, we read a number access input, and then we needed to compute a realizer for p of x. And, and that's all we needed to do and were able to do. But now we, are, we, we don't need to immediately return a realizer. Instead, we uh, just need to later call a callback function and the computation might make use of the callback. Let me illustrate that by implementing the Oracle function again from the beginning. Recall here we had the Oracle function, but it used a hypothetical version of Python with a support for backtracking. Now let's re-implement that without using backtracking, but using this callback style, okay? Um, so at the top, we have the Oracle function in, um, uh, in backtracking style. And now let's have it in uh, callback style. Yeah? Here is the realizer for not, not, um, or for, for all A, not, not A, or not A. Okay. I will again call it Oracle. Okay, so it reads A as input and now returns a realizer for that. Input, proposition A, output, a realizer for not, not A or not A. So recall what this actually amounts to. It amounts to this. So um, yeah, we need to return a lambda, um, which uh, has, it, by the way, do I need a parenthesis here? No, okay, good. so it was right before, thank you. Um, so that um, callback, the input to that lambda function will be um, a function, uh, a realizer, for A or not A implying bottom. And the output is a realizer for bottom. Okay. And the thing which will not work is to immediately call the callback. Um, because uh, uh, to immediately call, um, just a second, that I'm not confused. Um, No, okay. Um, yeah, uh, uh, let's backtrack. Uh, le let me say something different. I will call the callback um, with the following. Um, no, sorry, I'm confused for a second. Um, Ah, yes, yeah, oh, oh no, uh, all is right. Okay. Um, I, I call the callback function with the following input, one comma lambda x. So I immediately call the callback and tell it that I chose uh, that, that not a is true by signifying this one. And now I also need to supply a, a realizer for not a which will be a function which returns, which reads as input a number X, and then somehow magically computes a value of bottom. Um, and I do that as follows. Now here, instead of directly coming up with a value of bottom, which will be hard, I also recall that it was just a guess that not A holds. I will instead call the callback again, and this time using zero and X as arguments. The upshot of that is, it is possible to program in ordinary Python, where we don't have support for backtracking. It is still possible to implement the Oracle function. However, um, we cannot implement it in, in direct style. Instead, uh, we need to implement it in this callback style. So um, an Oracle function in this style is not possible which would directly return the result A or not A. 
but a Oracle function in this style is possible. And the reason why that's possible is because it now has more powerful um, um, abilities. Namely, it, if it wants to, it can call the callback several times. That is precisely like um, that, we are, that we can now be sensitive as to what the caller wants to do with our result. Okay, and um, yeah, some of you happen to already know that. Um, uh, this is direct style. Uh, this style I, uh, I titled um, callback-based style. The proper term in computer science for this style of programming is called um, continuation passing style. And the proper like formal term um, uh, for callbacks is called continuation. Um, the continuations were studied in computer science long before like the internet was a thing with callbacks and stuff. Okay. And also in computer science, we learn that there's a mechanical procedure for turning direct style programs into continuation style programs. It's more, more or less the procedure you, you witnessed me doing. Yeah? Um, all these source lines have some uh, analog here. Yeah? And this method of transforming direct style programs into continuation style programs has a name. It's called the CPS transformation, the continuation passing style transformation. This is a transformation which turns programs into new kind of programs, direct style programs into um, co continuation style programs. Why am I telling you all of that? Because uh, this GPS transformation is nothing else than the double negation transformation. We call it the double negation translation turns classical proofs into constructed proofs. In order to understand proofs better, we can always try to extract programs from that. Okay, and if we extract a program from the doubly negated translated proof, we obtain exactly the same as if we would have first extracted a program using backtracking and then eliminated that backtracking using the CPS transformation. Um, um, Note, uh, the CPS transformation in computer science is the same as um, the double negation translation in logic. Uh, more precisely, um, the CPS transformation is the shadow cast on programs from the more fundamental double negation translation. I'm saying like shadow, uh, it's not like the, the, the true thing because we, um, we can go from um, proofs to programs, but not always from programs to proofs. Hence proofs from that point of view, there are also others from that point of view, proofs are the more fundamental thing. And then we can always turn a proof into a program and also see what proof transformations are doing with the resulting, resulting programs. Okay, so that uh, all of that was an attempt to explain what the double negation translation is doing. It, um, uh, it simulates those backtracking by instead rewriting everything using those callbacks and then calling the callbacks multiple times. Now, the final trick of this mini course, uh, let's do even better. Let's uh, improve on that uh, theorem five and have the following theorem five. Classical logic proves this. Um, or let me just do one direction. If classical logic proves that, then also constructive logic proves that. from the same set, gamma axioms. Okay, as stated, this cannot be correct. Okay, there's still some precondition missing. 
um, um, the precondition is the following. Assuming that um, um, alpha and beta and all the assumptions and conclusions in gamma, by assumption, I mean what's ever to the left of the turnstile, by conclusion, I mean it's to the right of the turnstile. Assuming that all those are coherent formulas. We call a coherent formula, that's this restricted kind of formula where um, we may use all these logical connectives, but not these ones. Okay, so um, if the claim in question has this special syntactic property that all the axioms and also the claim um, uh, can be formatted as current formulas, then this theorem here is stating that we can turn a given classical proof into a constructive proof of the same claim. Notice, while this is our restriction, this restriction only pertains to the form of that claim and the axioms. Um, this is not a restriction on the form of all the auxiliary lemmas. The auxiliary lemmas needed in order to prove that alpha entails beta, beta can use uh, can be of arbitrary form. They can use all kinds of implications and universals. They don't. They do not need to be current formulas. Just the end result, the conclusion at the very end. Only that needs to be of that special form. Okay. Um, how does it work? Proof. Let's let's prove that. Yeah? Um, okay. We have alpha, and certainly alpha entails not not alpha. Okay. That was an exercise from the beginning. The other direction we don't have. That would be double negation elimination. But this direction we have. Okay. Now notice if phi is a Korean formula, then having just a single double negation in the front is the same as actually carrying out the double negation translation where we put lots of double negations in front of each disjunction, existential, and atomic formula. So um, by three, um, this, is, um, this entails alpha star. Let me write the... Um, uh, the reason for that, that's number three, theorem number three from, from above. Now, perhaps you have a suggestion how to continue. My, my, uh, I hope that in the end, I arrive at beta, yeah? Because I want to show that there's a constructive proof that alpha entails beta. Okay, that, but that's for now, it's just the hope. What can be the next step after this? Beta star, exactly. Have a look at number four, the second most important theorem of this mini course. If we have alpha entails beta classically, then we have that alpha star entails beta star constructively. Yeah, okay. And here in theorem five, we are given a classical proof of alpha entails beta, hence, by applying the double negation translation, by using the CPS transform, um, we get that alpha star entails beta star. Okay. Now observe by three again, that beta star uh, can be rewritten as, uh, or yeah, and it's equivalent to, but we just need that direction to not not beta. This is by three again because beta is of the required form. It's a Korean form. Now let me rewrite uh, not not beta um, in this form, this definition. And now it appears that we are stuck because from not not beta, we cannot in general deduce beta. And even, even if beta is a Korean formula, in general, we will not be able to go from not not beta 
to beta. Okay, so it appears that we are stuck. And now notice the following mir miracle. Um, perhaps uh, one, let me add a theorem number zero here, yeah? Namely, um, well, this here would be, this we don't have. Right now, I, I committed a mistake, yeah? We don't have that construct here. But we do have this special case. Not not bottom implies bottom. That is an, again an exercise if you want to do that. Not not bottom implies bottom. The reason is that not bottom is top and not top is bottom. Okay, so that works constructively. Uh, but now the miracle is the following. Note, theorems zero to four work just as well for any um, proposition um, Q, no F, in place of bottom. If everywhere inside of the theorem we replace bottom by some arbitrary F, all of that will still work. Note by negation, I then no longer mean implying bottom, now I mean implying F. So I really need to change everything. Every, everywhere where bottom was used before, including in the definition of negation, now I'm using some arbitrary F. The rest stays the same. That F is for Friedman, because this trick is sometimes called Friedman's trick. But it's, it also has other names, like escaping the continuation monad, or Barr's theorem. Um, why is that uh, uh, useful? Because, um, so all of that still holds, uh, but we could also use some, some arbitrary F, okay? And F is totally arbitrary. This, the double negation translation does not care about the uh, uh, precise value for F. And now I'm claiming that for a carefully chosen F, we do have this. We do have that not not beta entails beta. Do you know which F we need to choose for that? Well, what do you mean by free? Ah, Peter, yes, Peter. Notice, we always have not not bottom implies bottom. Here we have not not beta, and we would like that to entail beta. So it would be nice if beta was bottom. So let's just set F to be bottom, uh, to be beta. Let's just set F to be beta. Then, this can be read as not not bottom, and this will entail bottom. Okay. Yeah. Don't care. This theorem here above, zero to four, this theorem does not care at all about the actual value of bottom. You can use the actual bottom, absurdity contradiction for bottom, but you can also use some arbitrary F. You can use a true formula, a false formula, a provable formula, an unprovable formula, a formula which is only realized by a super Turing machine. Doesn't matter at all. Yeah. Yeah, because you need to recall what the meaning of negation is. Um, never forget, um, uh, not P is defined to be an abbreviation for P implies bottom. If now bottom changed, then also negation changed. And hence your, uh, what you knew about true and false 
is now like obsolete knowledge. Yeah. 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 Yeah, right. And that, that which, which is trivial to prove. Yeah, it's exactly this. Uh, I can rewrite this. Uh, let, me let me just copy that in a new line and actually do the, uh, the thing here. You will be able to prove that. In fact, you can prove it in ACTA. Let's quickly do it. Um, um, uh, so given beta, let's just write, yeah, okay, let's write beta. Um, we will have the following. If beta implies beta implies beta, then beta, okay. Uh, oops, uh, in ACTA I need to use this arrow. Okay, there's a proof of that. Okay, uh, by applying the identity function to this assumption. Um, okay, now uh, I would like to demonstrate that um, in action. So let's return to our example for Dixon's lemma. Okay. Um, Okay, recall Dixon's lemma, stating that some term in the sequence is less than or equal to the next term uh, for any sequence whatsoever. We first had a classical proof using the postulate. Then we reformulated that in a constructive fashion, but now we had double negations all over the place. It would be nice to here also write um, just Dixon alpha without the double negation. That would be nice. Um, uh, and a way how I would uh, propose to do that is by using the escape function. Um, that's the lemma that not not bottom implies bottom. Okay. Um, okay. So I would like to say, well, escape theorem. Yeah. The theorem Stay proof there proves not not Dixon alpha. And now using escape, I would like to get rid of the double negation in order to actually prove Dixon's lemma and not its, um, uh, its weak cousin, not not Dixon alpha. However, ACTA will reject that. Uh, firstly, because there's a naming coll uh, collision. Uh, let's just call that true for a second. But ACTA will reject that uh, because it says, well, the types don't quite match um, um, the escape function. Only works in this particular special case that we are you, uh, that we are having bottom. Not not bottom implies bottom, but Dixon alpha is not bottom. And now the insight from that trick. Even though Dixon alpha is not the same as bottom, it might just as well be. The proof doesn't care here. And in fact, I um, uh, up there, uh, so what this means is that for the purposes of this block, uh, we are assuming that some bottom is given to us, but we don't care which bottom that actually is, might be the true, proper, honest, logical bottom. Falsity can also be any other statement. So what we will now do is, we, load the, we will load this submodule here, which was a constructive, but uninformative proof. Uninformative because it just proved the double negation of Dixon's uh, lemma. We will load this module with a particular well-chosen value of bottom, namely beta. Yeah? I will do that here down below. So this will then be a fully constructive development. Given any function alpha, we uh, load the module from just before. But when loading that module, we use as a special case uh, for bottom, Dixon alpha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this, is exact, this is exactly stating the principle of proof by contradiction. 
which is okay in constructive mathematics in one special case, namely if you want to prove bottom, in no other special case. But now it turns out that bottom can just as well be Dixon alpha. And then the escape function states, if not not Dixon, uh, Dixon alpha holds, then Dixon alpha holds, where you need to be careful, it's not the standard not. Yeah? So it's more like if pseudo not, pseudo not Dixon alpha holds, then Dixon alpha. And that is the end result here, Dixon alpha. I can compile the file, uh, remove, get rid of that invalid code there. ACTA will uh, up there not print any error message. Yeah? This is the indication to ACTA that everything worked. And now let's do an example. I have an example function up there um, here, some example alpha, just random numbers. Yeah? And now let's run our proof here. Um, down there. Um, um, so within the constructive module, we have the function THM, which is not of type double negation of something. It's really of type Dixon alpha. Yeah. And now we, uh, I supply um, from the example module, this function alpha to it. And then the result is a pair consisting of the number two and some witness. And two is indeed correct because alpha of two is less than or equal than alpha of 10, uh, alpha of three, which is 10. Let's try a different example. Um, let's uh, put 300 there. Try again. Now it says, works again and says alpha of zero is smaller than or equal to alpha of one. It would work for, for whatever uh, I'm doing here. Let's do this as a final example. Now it says that alpha of three is less than or equal to alpha of four. Indeed, beginning with alpha of three, it's constant. I'm really, like just personal, I'm really amazed by yeah, this example, because um, uh, while the double negation translation is nice, yeah, uh, the double negation translation has that issue that it doesn't supply us with a constructive proof of the original claim, but of a constructive proof of this translated claim. Perhaps I was interested in the original claim after all. Yeah, and now using this Friedman's trick or escaping the continuation monad, we can recover the original claim. And the only requirement for that is, the only requirement for that is that the claim uh, and also the axioms um, satisfy some syntactical condition, but the auxiliary lemmas don't need to. Um, to re-express that in more concrete terms, this proof here um, of Dixon's lemma yeah, uses as an auxiliary lemma the existence of a minimum. And that is not at all of this coherent uh, type because it, um, it contains uh, here a universal quantifier. But still we can use that as a tool if all we want to arrive at at the end of the day is a theory, is a claim of that special form. So in that sense, um, you can regard the law of through the middle um, as a useful fiction. If it helps you to structure your proof, to come up with your proof, feel free to use it. You can always eliminate that fiction later on. The only requirement is that uh, the grand conclusion of your day's work is an entailment which, well, it, which satisfies this syntactical condition. But that's just a condition on the grand conclusion. It's not a condition on the auxiliary lemmas you might use. You can use as many auxiliary lemmas of arbitrary type, which are not amenable to this trick, yeah? as long as the conclusion satisfies this syntactical criterion. Um, to be even more concrete, yeah, um, uh, you can regard the existence of a minimum of a function as a useful fiction. Constructively, we don't really have 
for any function from a to n a minimum. But there might just as well be, you can just pretend that this, as long as the grand conclusion of your day's work is an entailment which, satisfy, which satisfies this syntactical requirement. It's similar to um, how the complex numbers are used for fiction. You don't really need the complex numbers. You can always make do with pairs of real numbers. Also, the negative numbers are used for fiction. You don't really need negative numbers. You can always separately keep track of what money you have and what money you owe. You don't actually need to carry out the difference operation in the ring of integers. Uh, integers. Of course, it's useful, but you don't strictly speaking need it. It's the same with the law of slew the middle in case this description is satisfied. Feel free to use it. You won't need to use it. It can always be mechanically eliminated. That's it. That's what I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Do you have questions, comments, ideas? Go ahead. Yeah, right. Indeed, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Right, yes. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I don't have a full answer right now. Uh, let me supply the following partial answer. Namely, um, um, what makes this trick work is that backtracking idea. Um, However, for that backtracking idea to succeed in the end, uh, it's important that we only backtrack a finite amount of times. Now, if your statement is something like for every number it holds that, and you want that result to hold simultaneously for all numbers, then you might need to backtrack infinitely often because you need to backtrack a couple of times for the first number, then a couple of times for the next number, next, 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 and you never stop backtracking. However, if your claim does not contain a universal quantifier, um, then uh, we just need to backtrack a couple of times corresponding to the extensor quantifier and so on, and then call it a day. Um, note, by the way, I forgot to tell you that, um, what is okay is that we have three variables appearing in here, which amounts to like uh, that we have one universal quantifier on the outside. This is also what we have here. We are saying for every function alpha, for every function, we have Dixon of alpha. Yeah? It's just that we may not like freely mix universals and existentials, but we can say in the very beginning, let a couple of stuff be given. Let an alpha, let a function alpha be given, let that be given, let that be given. That's fixed. And now you do your trick. Um, great question. I don't have an answer. I will need to think about it. Great question. Let me relate for the internet. The question is, uh, let, let me rephrase it and put it more broadly. Um, what about super Turing machines? Could they be allowed to backtrack an infinite amount of times? Could we then perhaps have a variant of number of theorem five, which doesn't have this restriction at the price of needing super Turing machines? Great question. There's also a question from the internet. What um, sets apart the connectives admitted in Green formulas from implication for all? That's similar to your question. Thank you very much, Stefano. Great question. Um, uh, these two uh, logical connectives might need an infinite amount of backtracking, whereas the others don't. Yeah. I yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. 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 Y
You mean a future like in JavaScript, in web programming? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, great question. The answer is it's not different from this. Um, the, this is more or less the story of using futures, using promises, as it's also sometimes called in the programming community. Um, um, and they allow you to um, have a result for as many x as you wish, but not for all of them simultaneously. Yeah, because for every uh, for each particular value of some natural number x, yeah, uh, you have this future, and this grid might require backtracking, and then at some point it's done. Um, but for each x, you need a certain amount, a finite amount of backtracking if you want the result to hold for all x's. You would need an infinite amount of backtracking, and that is the thing which uh, where things break, except perhaps with using super dream machines. I will think about it. Further questions, comments? There are a couple of exercises in case uh, you want to spend more time on uh, these topics. Um, um, for instance, uh, where, where you are asked to, um, to do the double negation translation and stuff like that. Um, uh, and for instance, this, this one is quite difficult and quite a bit of a brain teaser, but also very rewarding. Uh, this states the following. If you are given a function from n to 0, 1, then of course, in classical logic, this function will attain infinitely many zeros or infinitely many ones, because there are infinitely many function values in total, but just two um, uh, two possible resulting values, zero and one, then of sure one of them will be attained infinitely often. That's what's written here. For any number a, you will find some b later on in the number line where f of b is zero, is zero, and here with one. Using that as a lemma, you can conclude the following. Um, you can conclude that there will be at least two values which are the same. f of some i will be the same as f of some j some distinct j. Because in the case that f attains infinitely many, often the value 0, well, then there are, there are even infinitely many uh, uh, same values. So in particular, there are two. And also, if f attains infinitely often the value 1, well, then in particular, there will be two times that it attains the value 1. This proof is hopelessly unconstructive. We don't have that in constructive mathematics because we cannot, we are not omniscient. We cannot um, grasp the entire, entirety of f. However, the conclusion that their numbers a is smaller b such that f of a is equal to f of b, that validates the syntactical requirement. And hence, you know from the outset that the classical proof can be turned into a constructive proof of the same statement. And hence, there will also be an algorithm for actually computing that. Um, it, it will be an algorithm which um, internally backtracks, but in the end, that's just like for, uh, for managing its state, in the end, it will just be a proper algorithm, an honest algorithm, which you could implement in Python without backtracking. And it might be fun to like, actually see what, what is this mysterious algorithm. And it is a different algorithm from the following very simple one, just compute f of zero, f of one, f of two. These are three values. Among those three values, you will find two which are the same. Very simple algorithm to quickly conclude. And now the question is, is that algorithm obtained from the generative tools the same as that one? And then you also have an exercise for verifying um, this uh, central theorem about the double negation translation and a couple more. And here also you have a, like a negative result, something out of which you just cannot con extract meaningful constructive content. You can always have that with the double negations, but here you cannot construct extract meaningful constructive content, just to round up the picture. Um, let me stop the recording, and then I'll just hang around for a little bit.